Uh, hello everyone. Uh, now uh, I think we are all done and we can start. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the RBF uh, to organize today's event uh, with us. And also I would like to thank uh, uh, all the speakers, Professor uh, Dr. Zia Akıncı, Yasemin uh, Cetinel, Sam Whitehouse, Lindy uh, Patterson and Bashar Shahin, and of course all the participants for their uh, attendance. Uh, we have uh, gathered here at one of the uh, ISTAC programs with the RBF. Uh, today's topic uh, is a quite hot topic uh, in dispute settlement. Uh, and uh, as you all um, know that uh, COVID-19 has affected uh, everybody's life and all the sectors, as well as justice and legal proceedings. However, uh, unlike judiciary or the courts, uh, almost all the arbitration centers uh, did not stop their arbitral uh, proceedings and uh, continued uh, virtually. Uh, and we as ISTAC um, also did not stop our proceedings. Uh, and in March, uh, we have prepared our online hearing rules and procedures straight away. And since then, many uh, of our hearings and meetings are held uh, uh, virtually. Today, uh, we have experts from the RBF uh, to talk about how uh, the dispute boards have reacted uh, to the effects of COVID-19. Uh, before the panelists uh, start, um, uh, as you all would know, that there will be a really uh, short opening speech uh, from Yasemin Çetinel first, a member of uh, the RBF uh, Board of Directors. And then after her, uh, Professor Dr. Zia Akınca, the president of um, Istak uh, will take the floor uh, for opening speeches. Now, the uh, floor is yours, uh, Ms. Chetina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yasin Bey, thank you for your very kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure today uh, to join this webinar among our distinguished co colleagues. Uh, and I would also like to thank, uh, very briefly, firstly to Istak. Uh, as a continuation of our collaboration agreement and, of course, the president of ISTAC, dear Professor Akinci. Uh, also, uh, Bashar Shahin as our DRBF country rep for Turkey, uh, holding this event right after uh, the election as country representative. And finally, uh, my distinguished panelists, Linda Patterson and Sam uh, Whitehouse as well. Uh, as you know, very briefly, uh, dispute, Ro dispute Board Resolution Foundation, and I will refer to it as the RBF in my speech, uh, we have been established as of early 90s, and uh, we work to promote the dispute board concept as a whole globally to provide trainings and establish the best industry practices for the concept. We have now over uh, 1,000 members, uh, and we are steadily increasing our membership uh, as well from year to year. We deeply value our collaboration with ISTAC, uh, which is the prominent arbitration center, not only in Turkey, but uh, in the region uh, we consider. And we believe that effective use of dispute boards uh, go hand in hand with the effective use of arbitration. So uh, the cooperation is very important uh, between two organizations <clears throat> to um, result in the good industry practice for the sector, the construction sector as a whole. Um, we are already aware of the uh, effective usage uh, impact on the dispute board uh, processes as well as the construction projects and we would like to raise this awareness uh, both at the local point of view and from the global perspective as well. And in this regard, uh, ISTAC cooperation is of vital importance for us uh, as we hope to establish a standing uh, working relationship to reach all the relevant audience together. Thank you. And I think Professor Akinji will take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Yasem, and thank you for your very nice introduction. And indeed, I fully agree that uh, ISTAC is very pleased and honored to organize this event together with the DRBF. Uh, Bashar Bey and Yasemin from Turkey, we uh, not only is the distinguished colleagues, but the good friends of us. And I'm very pleased and honored to host uh, Mr. Whitehouse and Mrs. Patterson in our uh, conference. Uh, I'm very obliged to, uh, that uh, 
they very kindly accepted the invitation. We are having challenging time all over the world. And the good thing is somehow construction projects are going, but uh, the contract management became even more delicate at this time. And as Yasemin was saying, the efficient dispute resolution is getting more and more important. And efficient dispute resolution means fast, correct, binding, and neutral dispute resolution that the practitioners needed. At this junction, DAB and arbitration offers very efficient dispute resolution for construction industry. Needless to say, DAB offers a very fast and economic resolution for the disputes, as long as the parties agree with the outcome. For the remaining dispute, arbitration offers neutral binding and efficient dispute resolution in construction uh, industry. So therefore, we believe cooperation by DAB, the RBF, and arbitration is very important. And for ESTAC, significant percentage of our cases arise from construction contracts. So therefore, um, as much as we can, we support any uh, activities together with the DAB expert. And uh, hopefully today, it will be a useful conference to share our experiences and exchange our knowledge at this challenging time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ojan. Uh, now um, we can start uh, our uh, uh, speeches uh, with the panelists. Uh, before we uh, start, actually, I would like to remind the speakers that uh, they have uh, 12 minutes each. Uh, and uh, once all the speakers finish their uh, presentations, we will continue with the Q&A uh, uh, questions. Uh, so. Those who want to ask questions uh, should write their questions uh, in the Q&A section, uh, which is at the right uh, bottom side. Now, uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor, Zia, Professor Dr. Zia Akınca. Uh, Professor Akınca is the president of uh, ISTAC. Uh, he is also a member of Istanbul Bar Association and the chairman of the International uh, Private Law Department of Galatasaray University Faculty of Law. He has uh, for years been recognized, for, uh, recognized by legal directories as a leading individual in arbitration, dispute resolution, and uh, international commercial law and construction. Professor Akınca has been involved in a large number of domestic and international disputes under several arbitration rules, such as EXIT, ANCITRAL, ICC, LCIA, uh, SCC, DIAC, uh, TRAC, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Akinji uh, will talk about ISTAC's uh, reaction to COVID-19 and innovations in arbitration that ISTAC presents. Floor is yours, Ojan. Thank you very much. Thank you for the generous, uh, generous uh, introduction. Um, I will talk about the new normal in ISTAC arbitration and generally in arbitration. Um, COVID-19 made some changes in our life and especially in arbitration as well. Uh, but the good bright side of it, uh, bright side of this is, is that did not stop its operation during the COVID-19 period at all. And as Yasin Bey was explaining, straight after the uh, COVID-19 uh, issue, ISTAC made up its rules on virtual hearing and adopted the rules that made the um, uh, virtual hearings predictable and foreseeable and uh, transparent for the practitioners. At the moment, almost all of our hearings are being conducted virtually. The new normal changed the practice of arbitration in uh, some aspects. For example, nowadays, we interview our clients through video conferences. So our traditional meeting with the uh, clients or potential witnesses is almost a history for all of us. And witnesses are trained 
again through witness co video conferences. And these days, all the documents are electronic. For some of us, it doesn't matter, even if it is sometimes more convenient, but I know many of the colleagues, they say, if, if I cannot touch the paper physically, I, I cannot understand everything is too abstract for me. I mean, it, 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 I am lucky, I don't feel in this way, but uh, as we are aware, in practice, some of the colleagues feel in that way, but um, the situation is almost all the documents are filed electronically. And again, cross-examination is being conducted through video conferences. Well, there are significant differences. It is sometimes difficult to qualify it as a disadvantage or advantage, but definitely it is different, especially for the witnesses. Uh, the honesty of the witnesses is in question, then it may make uh, some differences. But the situation is as it is, and in ISTAC practice, we conduct the hearings virtually, but to make sure we, we get, we obtain the consent of the parties before the virtual hearing. And again, to make it transparent and forcible, we encourage the arbitrator to make a procedural order one that have rulings on virtual hearing and uh, uh, filing the documents electronically. As long as it is agreed and foreseeable, it makes difference and also it prevents from any attack against the um, uh, arbitration award, especially at the stage of setting aside or enforcement. In procedural order one, the arbitrators can rule how they are going to accept the electronic file. They may have a special platform, etc., and also how the virtual hearing is going to be conducted. So therefore, um, a procedural order one or the pre-hearing conference is very important to inform the parties about the new normal arbitration rules and also to prevent from any setting aside just because of this electronic filing or uh, virtual hearing. At the pre-hearing, there may be some practical issues that the arbitrators can handle. Um, in our procedural rules, we already um, uh, ruled some of them. We already provide some rulings on these issues, but it is always uh, better if the arbitrators talk about these issues with the parties and either in the procedural order one or at the pre-hearing conference, the arbitrator can um, inform the parties about some practical issues such as which platform the hearing is going to be conducted. I mean, these days, most of us are very familiar with Zoom or Microsoft Team, etc. But there may be some other issues because some of the parties may not be familiar uh, with the platform that the arbitrator is suggesting. Uh, I mean, in ISTAC, we had one experience. Uh, we had an uh, arbit arbitrator who is not very familiar with the IT issues, and he said, there is only there is going to be only two attorneys participating in my hearing. Would you mind if I organize it through WhatsApp call? <laughs> he said, if the parties are happy, if the arbitrator is happy, why not? Uh, so as long as the parties and the arbitrators are happy with the platform, of course, there is no problem. But one of the practical issue is the parties and the arbitrators should feel comfortable about the digital platform that they are going to use. Of course, confidentiality can be an issue, but our experience in ISTAC shows that most of the parties are happy with the um, video conference program that we use. So we try to arrange some very confidential and or higher confidentiality program, but at the end of the day, they are not as useful as the other uh, video conference program that 
the practitioner use. So it may be more problematic than a solution. It, the best thing is just to discuss it with the parties and the arbitrators. One of the most important thing is the internet capacity of the parties, availability of the internet should be pretest and uh, the arbitrator should make sure that everybody, including the witnesses, has a proper internet connection. Because one of the most annoying things in the middle of the hearing, if someone dropped, uh, then uh, you need to repeat or you need to have a break. So these words are very dangerous, you know, during my uh, speech. I may have a problem, but at the end of the day, it is always uh, tested before and just make sure everybody uh, has a proper internet connection. One of the most important thing is list of participants. Of course, it is very important for the confidentiality as well. So the arbitrator should ask the list of participants and after getting the consent of the parties, the link of the video conference should be sent to all the uh, participants. There are some practical issues. For example, um, all the microphones should be turned off and only um, uh, the speaking person, either the council, one of the councils or the witness uh, or any other person who is cross-examining or asking any question uh, can have can turn the microphone on, otherwise it will be a mess. So the arbitrator should uh, rule this before the arbitration. Again, uh, it is advisable that only the leading councils and the arbitral tribunal can have the camera on. So it gives the uh, freedom to the rest of the team. And also the arbitrator can uh, focus on the speaking people um, and the uh, leading uh, councils. But of course, if the parties prefer otherwise, the parties can have the other way uh, around. One of the uh, most important thing is the witness should have a proper access to the documents, either physically, or there should be a very good uh, document navigation electronically maybe, but definitely the witnesses should be trained on how to find the exhibit that uh, any of the council or the arbitrator may refer to. This is uh, also uh, very important. Another way is uh, the document can be shown on the screen, but uh, we need to be careful because uh, one of the parties may object because as we know, when we have cross-examination, uh, we need to focus on the uh, witness and witness reaction, even the face reaction is very important. So therefore, if you see only the document and very tiny uh, picture of the witness, it may not be very efficient. So in, uh, therefore, uh, before the uh, hearing, the arbitrators and the parties should agree how to navigate the documents. Another issue is the witness should be alone in the room. So there are practical solution for this, as we say, uh, 360 uh, degree cameras or uh, someone to observe the witness can be solution. Or very simply, time to time, the arbitrator can ask, could you please uh, uh, show the room through your camera? So this kind of uh, um, uh, measurement can be uh, taken. Whatever happens, as we stated in our ISTAC rules, um, the due diligence is the bottom line. For some reason, if any party complain about the due diligence, violations of the due diligence, the arbitrator has the authority to terminate the virtual hearing because if someone somehow cannot access the hearing or cannot utilize its due process right. So the due diligence is, again, the bottom line in the virtual hearing as well. In our experience, we checked the experience of the virtual hearing and we always got uh, positive uh, feedback. But one should note that the question is not which one is better, virtual hearing or the hearing in person. This is not the question. We need to focus what is the best practice to conduct virtual hearing during this pandemic uh, period. 
So the last point that I would like to uh, mention is, will this stay after pandemic? This is another point that we are going to experience in future. It is doubtless that these virtual hearings offer uh, incredible cost and uh, time saving to the parties. And it is not difficult to predict that, especially for the small cases and non-complex cases, this experience that we have during this pandemic may help and without um, very uh, complicated uh, hearing organization for the small cases or non-complex cases, we can utilize virtual hearing more often. At least even for the complex cases, I think we all will be more open-minded for video conferences um, in the absence of the uh, witnesses, any witnesses, because I remember before the pandemic, it was a very big issue if any of the witness cannot participate in the hearing for any reason, sometimes very legitimate reason, the opposing party made a huge uh, noise about it, saying that it is impossible, we don't want it, 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 we cannot accept this. But I think somehow we all got used to it or we have more tolerance. So I think after the pandemic, as we say, inshallah, after the pandemic, one of the remaining thing will be, we will be more open-minded for the video conferences and at least hybrid virtual hearing. This concludes my uh, speech and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ujan. Uh, now we can uh, go to move to second speaker, Yasemin Çetinel. Uh, Ms. Chetinel is a lawyer uh, specializing in international construction law, international investment and commercial arbitration with a specific focus on construction disputes. She currently serves as the board member of, uh, for uh, Dispute Resolution Board Foundation Region 2, uh, responsible for Middle East and North Africa. She is the founder of the Chetinel Law Firm based in Istanbul. And uh, she's going to uh, inform us um, with the latest developments uh, for the RBF and the recent agreement with the uh, FIDIC. Floor is yours, Yasin. Uh, thank you very much, Yasin Bey, for the kind introduction. As you stated, uh, my subject is uh, actually the highlights from uh, the last year uh, from the RBF. Uh, and uh, I will end up with our cooperation agreement uh, with FIDIC. So, uh, despite the strange and very harsh conditions of 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we were able to uh, achieve quite a number of uh, um, accomplishments uh, during the year. And we are all uh, very proud of uh, this and excited for what these new accomplishments will bring for the dispute board concept itself and the uh, uh, the RBF uh, as an organization. So I will very briefly touch upon four separate news from the RBF. The first one is um, our guideline uh, that we were able to publish on how to uh, best conduct uh, the dispute board process at virtual levels. So uh, in the new era. And then second issue will be our cooperation with World Bank on the gender-based violence issues. And third issue, it will be our cooperation with Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, which is essentially uh, a first uh, for our organization, as I will uh, more detailedly uh, explain um, very shortly. And finally, as I stated, I will uh, summarize our uh, recent arrangement with FIDIC on the assessment exercise in relation with the expansion of their uh, president's list. So firstly, um, let me uh, very briefly summarize the guidelines we were able to publish on the impact of COVID-19 to the dispute board process and how to uh, efficiently conduct all the process at virtual level. Uh, I will not reiterate uh, the content of this guideline because um, it is more or less uh, very familiar with uh, what Zia Hoca was explaining. Uh, on the uh, arbitration centers uh, adopt, uh, adopting the new measures, let's say, in the new era. 
uh, but um, perhaps uh, it has some differences because as you know, the dispute board process, uh, one of the core elements is the in-person contact with the project team throughout the project. So um, it's not only the hearing process, but we also carry out site visits and meetings with the parties um, for a long time period. Um, and we also always mention that this in-person contact uh, contributes a lot to the trust relationship that has to be built between the dispute board and the project members, the contractor and the employer. So despite this, uh, we all experienced 2020, of course, and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, very soon after, travel became very problematic. So inside visits or meetings with the parties uh, became impossible after a while. Um, that said, as uh, Professor Akinji was also saying, the virtual uh, means also developed very quickly. Well, they were existent, but the experience was not uh, very frequent. Uh, from the dispute board practitioners as well. So we as the RBF, we were aware of the requirement to adopt the new features. And uh, I personally think we were quickly uh, responding to it. And accordingly, uh, with all the contributions with our, uh, from our members, uh, we were able to draft a guidelines uh, to provide insight uh, on how to best use the virtual means in order to continue the existing dispute board processes as well as to start a dispute board uh, process from the outset at a virtual level. So our guideline may be found at our website, which is uh, www.drb.org. And um, it basically also informs uh, on what to do or the checklist for the practitioners uh, before starting to uh, conduct their uh, dispute board processes uh, in their contract. And uh, two significant differences from uh, arbitration processes. The first one is, as you know, the dispute board is a contractual mechanism. So, um, any kind of uh, regulations or um, uh, rules should be existent in your contract. And it wasn't always the case, for example, uh, for the dispute board members and or the parties to be able or entitled uh, to hold hearings or uh, meetings or uh, site visits at a virtual level. So uh, the guideline establishes uh, a checklist to check the contractual documentation and, and to adapt it if necessary uh, in accordance with the new requirements of the virtual means. The second issue, I'm not going to reiterate the, you know, um, the criteria uh, of which platform to use or the data protection obligations or the recording of the meetings or hearings and the technical capacity of equipment by the parties. But um, specifically for the site visits, there may be an important element. Uh, as you know, the site visits were intending to give an insight on the site progress. So um, the technical means such as drone foot footage started to get used uh, in dispute board mechanism. Uh, so uh, any kind of rules and or um, protocols to be drafted should take into consideration to have uh, arrangements necessary to provide the relevant insight for the site progress, uh, usually with drawn footages that are recorded just prior to the site visit itself. So all detailed information may be found in our guidelines, uh, which are actually public. Uh, and I would also align with Professor Akinji on one point. Uh, it is the impact of COVID-19 uh, and whether or not that impact will be continuing uh, once COVID-19 uh, hopefully soon uh, abolishes uh, from Earth. So I personally think that for the dispute board uh, processes, maybe a hybrid uh, mechanisms may be um, uh, remaining because uh, 
On one side, of course, in-person site visits are necessary and vital. But on the other uh, hand, it is also very useful to hold more regular meetings with the parties, which may be held uh, very easily with uh, virtual means rather than, uh, you know, each time traveling to the site for the occasion. So I think we can accept, expect a hybrid uh, process uh, in the upcoming years as an impact of COVID uh, continuously uh, on our dispute board mechanisms. So this concludes uh, the first news. And the second news is about the collaboration with World Bank on uh, the uh, gender-based violence procedures and uh, the DRBF's input in it. So as you may know, World Bank introduced new policies and sanctions for non-compliance in relation with gender-based violence issues at sites and incorporated these policies and sanctions in its new batch of tender documentation, which also includes FIDIC 2017 series. Very briefly to put, in accordance with this policy, employers, contractors, and even lower tier uh, entities, which are the subcontractors, are obliged to, or, um, to get trained and to get orientation on the gender-based violence issues before commencing the project and in the continuation of the project itself it is a continuous obligation to have the procedure in place and to have the monitoring in place uh, for the gender-based violence matters uh, and the monitoring uh, is given as a duty to the dispute boards so therefore uh, world bank and uh, DRBF uh, liaised and made a co co uh, collaboration agreement according to which as the RBF we have published our guidelines on you know for the dispute board practitioners on how to best conduct this new monitoring uh, process uh, included in the new FIDIC 17 2017 version uh, for World Bank projects. Uh, very briefly uh, the dispute board uh, position and role is as follows. It takes part in the orientation meeting at the outset of the project and uh, it makes the site visit every 90 days as opposed to 120 days in the previous FIDIC. And in each site visit in the agenda, there is the gender-based violence issue. So it has to monitor the issues and or any complaints that are made uh, through contractor or employer. So in this regard, uh, both parties, employer or contractor may start uh, the complaint or the question uh, related to the gender-based violence. And why it is important, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, not only the regulation, but also the sanction is regulated uh, in the new tender documentation because in case, uh, as a result of these inquiries and uh, the compliance check uh, with the contracts, contractual procedural obligations uh, from the contractor or subcontractor side, uh, it may result in a ban for a two years term from any kind of World Bank funded project uh, for the future. So it's quite, uh, you know, uh, vital sanction. Uh, therefore, it will be of vital importance throughout the project itself for the monitoring. So, and the third issue and news uh, from the RBF is our cooperation with Millennium Challenge Corporation. Millennium Challenge Corporation is uh, a financial institution funding, funding the infrastructure projects. Uh, it is the United States aid agency and it provides grants, not loans. That is the uh, difference from most of the uh, financial institutions. Uh, and because it actually provides the grants, it has a much more hands on approach on the project. So it really values the uh, bid procedures. Uh, and also because the uh, bids uh, that are funded by Millennium Challenge Corporation are not subject to local law, but rather governed by the international treaty itself, it has its own bid challenge procedure included in the tender documentation and regulation. 
uh, which is uh, a two-step process and which was so far conducted by the local uh, the corporation's local agencies because it has the local agencies in each country that it provides grants for and now after the uh, collaboration agreement with the rbf uh, the local agency will only handle the level one uh, complaints and the appeal uh, issues will be conducted by the rbf and for that purpose the rbf um, had to establish a general list of selected DRBF members who may be appointed for this duty in each specific country and project. And I'm very pleased to say that in 2020, we have finished um, elaborating and selecting our general list, and we have even finished a specific list for uh, um, MCC entity uh, in Mongolia, uh, I think as of August 2020. Lastly, again, a 2020 news, and which is very important for us, it's our cooperation with FIDIC. And as you may know, FIDIC has currently a list of slightly over 50 people in its president list. And this list is used uh, to appoint dispute board members or chairman in case FIDIC is chosen as the appointing authority. And if you consider that it is a global list, um, it was uh, found necessary by FIDIC that this list should enlarge in a short time period. And that said, in order to um, gather such list and uh, to have people on that list, FIDIC always used a very um, high level, high standard assessment process uh, after which if uh, the um, candidates were able to succeed, they were elected uh, in the FIDIC president's list. So in order to enlarge this list, a huge assessment uh, exercise uh, is needed. Um, and FIDIC currently aims to enlarge this list to a number of 450 people, if not more, it's in their uh, you know, agenda. So um, it has to be done in, uh, in a short time period uh, in a very concentrated matter. In that respect, and also with the general aim that uh, there is certainly a need for uh, more trained individuals in dispute board uh, processes, uh, FIDIC and DRBF got together and uh, they have made a major agreement uh, for the RBF to assist in their ambitious goal. So as per this agreement, the DRB, as the RBF, we are going to establish uh, um, examination committees and assessment committees, basically, uh, on the basis I'm taking from our membership, of course, uh, uh, for the assessment program that will need to be in place for this expansion of the president's list as well as we are going to provide a continuing professional development training program for the approved adjudicators on the FIDIC president's list. So uh, the role is twofold. And uh, I'm very pleased to inform that the first uh, goal, uh, which is to establish the relevant committees, uh, is already achieved by the RBF and the committees started working. And the first, uh, it's a expected that the first assessment exams will take place in 2021, which is this year. So with that, uh, I conclude my speech and I will be, of course, open to any kind of questions at uh, question and answer section. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cetine. Uh, now the third speaker, Bashar Shahin, who is going to talk about the applications of um, dispute boards in Turkey. Uh, Bashar Shahin is not a lawyer. Uh, he's a civil engineer with a law degree, actually, and uh, several co arbitration qualifications he has. Uh, he serves as contract claim consultant, uh, expert witness, and dispute uh, board member. Uh, currently, he serves as country representative for Turkey for Dispute Resolution Board Foundation, and he's the uh, director in ICM Consulting 
based in Istanbul. Floor is your Pasha Şahin. Thank you, Yasemin Bey. And thanks to Yasemin for this excellent news. Very excited to hear about collaboration between FIDIC, World Bank and DRBF. And that shows also the uh, importance of uh, cooperation uh, between uh, DRBF, especially here in Turkey, and uh, ISTAC. I will have a, a presentation. So I will uh, put this uh, on the screen. OK, so my topic here is uh, I will cover uh, the dispute boards, uh, mainly uh, in Turkey. So I'm not going to uh, mention uh, the impacts uh, of uh, COVID uh, in this uh, short presentation. Uh, well, we know uh, Turkey is a developing uh, country and uh, we get uh, a lot of uh, investments, especially into infrastructure. So that means uh, a lot of construction and uh, construction, uh, if it is uh, related uh, to any kind of uh, foreign uh, investments or uh, foreign credit, then uh, we, use, we, we see a lot of use of PD contracts. So the speed ports uh, we see in Turkey uh, mainly use uh, in construction projects. And uh, if uh, there are FIDIX, uh, the use of FIDIC, uh, the use of the speed ports are uh, even uh, more. Uh, in Turkey, there are uh, European Union finance projects. World Bank finance projects, uh, ADB, uh, Asian Development Bank, European Investment Bank. Uh, those kind of projects uh, are uh, usually uh, utilized from FIDIC type of contracts. And if we use FIDIC type of contracts, DAB use is a, a very important uh, element uh, of such projects. Uh, another uh, type of uh, projects we use are the PPP, uh, PPP type of uh, projects, public-private uh, partnership. Uh, we'll see a lot of city hospitals, transportation projects, and uh, the use of uh, dispute ports are also very common in this in this type of uh, projects. Uh, if we need to give some examples, uh, for example, the Marmara projects uh, that we all know of, uh, we are talking about uh, three to four billion dollars projects, including uh, all sections, and uh, dispute boards are successfully uh, executed uh, in this project. We're talking about dozens of referrals to dispute boards, and uh, disputes and conflicts between the parties uh, are being resolved uh, before it goes uh, to uh, litigation or uh, court or uh, even uh, arbitration levels. Uh, more Examples of projects, we're talking about transportation projects, water projects, water treatment projects, hospital projects. Uh, they all use dispute boards in Turkey. So I would say use of dispute boards in, is, in Turkey is, is very common. Uh, another note here uh, about dispute boards, we don't have a legislation under Turkish law to support education like there is in under English law, we don't have that. So it's based on contract agreement between the parties. Uh, also, the last bullet here is, we need to note outside Turkey, uh, use of dispute boards by Turkish contractors. So Turkish contractors are extremely active in the region. And uh, we know uh, many Turkish contractors have dispute boards uh, applications in their contracts. Uh, abroad and outside Turkey. So it's important that also the contractors and contractor associations are knowledgeable about dispute boards. Uh, briefly about the benefits from our observation uh, from Turkey, uh, it's definitely a fast track dispute resolution method. And we are talking for uh, about 84 days between one party asks for a decision and uh, it's, it calls the, the, the FIDIC contracts and mainly uh, the, the contracts uh, that use dispute boards uh, refer to an 84 days of duration to get a decision. So that makes uh, dispute boards a very fast track 
mechanism uh, to find the resolution to the dispute. Definitely cost effective. And uh, another advantage of these speed ports are uh, the uh, expert practitioners. You can, uh, you can choose uh, as a dispute board uh, member or a dispute board cha chairman, an, an expert uh, legal professional, an engineer, a quantity surveyor, and that depends uh, on the party's basically uh, choice. If your dispute is complicated uh, on a technical matter, uh, it's, 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 it's acceptable uh, to use a, a technician uh, as a dispute board member. Uh, another advantage of our dispute boards we see uh, is uh, the claim prevention and, and avoidance. Uh, we have uh, an, as an option uh, a standing uh, DAB uh, mechanism. So parties do not need to wait till the end of the project to find a, a resolution to their dispute. They can do it uh, throughout uh, the project. That is possible and allowed uh, by the uh, standard contracts uh, that allow FIDIC. Again, the parties can choose whether to get an advice uh, from the dispute board. A, a binding decision or a binding and final decision uh, from the dispute board, uh, depending on their agreement at the contract level. So that's uh, all possible. Uh, from uh, also from experience here in Turkey, uh, we see uh, you know dispute boards are mainly used with uh, government contracts and. Uh, we see challenges that the employers uh, making uh, in making decisions uh, to execute decisions uh, that will result in additional time, additional money uh, for the other parties, saying contractors. So getting a decision from a dispute board throughout the project uh, supports uh, and encourages uh, the employers in that aspect. So we see a lot of uh, examples of that uh, in Turkey. I mean, that's not only specifically uh, a good uh, example in Turkey, it's quite uh, the same uh, throughout the region. Uh, it's, it's a support mechanism uh, in order to execute certain decisions uh, for the employers. Uh, for the contractors, uh, the best advantage in our experience is the uh, its availability uh, to get an early resolution of disputes because uh, for, for the contractors, it's really key uh, to, find a, uh, to, to find a solution to their disputes and uh, have access to cash flow to get the money or additional time. So dispute boards give this kind of opportunity uh, to, to contractors uh, in our experience. And these are mainly uh, the main uh, advantages of dispute boards here in Turkey. Uh, Last uh, slide, I have uh, challenges. Uh, well, uh, I would say dispute boards are getting more and more uh, popular here in Turkey. So we don't get as many questions from uh, uh, the business uh, as we used to, uh, let's say 10 years ago, but still uh, not many parties uh, are familiar. So I uh, urge uh, all the attendees uh, to listen to webinars, visit uh, the website, the RBF Foundation visit website, and uh, try to get familiar with these speed ports. Uh, different views by legal contractors, employers, will see opinions like from contractors and employers uh, saying these speed ports, why to use these speed ports? We have arbitration, we have litigation, but it's not an alternative to arbitration or litigation actually. Uh, and we always say uh, dispute boards and uh, arbitration uh, needs to go hand in hand and they are uh, not, al not alternatives uh, to each other. And we see also uh, legal professionals uh, deleting uh, DAB clauses uh, for, from, the, from the contracts, which we obviously do not support. Uh, procedural application challenges. Uh, well, dispute boards, uh, once they elected and uh, have a, a have their contract service agreement signed, uh, they make their procedural uh, rules uh, for the application uh, of, the, of the dispute board mechanism. And, uh, and in Turkey, we, we, we came along 
quite a bit uh, procedural differences between uh, the dispute ports. So that uh, needs to be improved uh, and encouraged. Uh, and if you are a contractor or employer uh, representing your party, I think that's another issue that uh, needs further improvements. Uh, we can see the speed ports in the contracts, but unfortunately it's not executed, which means the speed ports are introduced in the contract between the parties, but throughout the project, they are not being used. So there, it's calls for a dispute port to be, uh, to be chosen in 84 days or 56 days after the contract is signed, but never executed. So that's something we see. And also the last bullet, uh, how to appoint uh, a dispute board member. Uh, FIDIC has a list for uh, experienced professionals. And uh, obviously parties can uh, ask the dispute board foundation uh, for available names and expert names for their contracts. Uh, the last point uh, I have, uh, in Turkey, uh, we need a more uh, dispute board uh, resolution uh, foundation. We need more members. Please visit our website. It's uh, drbf.org. Uh, it's $35 uh, per year for emerging markets. You can have access to all this information that we discussed today, to all the manuals uh, and uh, guidelines that uh, the board uh, provides. And you can have access to more information by calling uh, our board. Uh, thank you. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you, uh, Bashar Bey, uh, for your very valuable um, presentation. Now is the uh, fourth speaker, uh, Lindy Patterson. Uh, Lindy is a full-time arbitrator, lawyer, dispute board member and chair and UK uh, adjudicator with uh, 39 Essex chambers in London. Uh, she's also a QC. Uh, she was the first woman uh, to be appointed to the FIDIX president list of international adjudicators. Uh, she's also the past pre uh, former president of the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation Region 2. Uh, today, she will talk on uh, current trends uh, in the use of dispute boards. The uh, floor is yours, Lindy. Thank you very much, uh, Yasin and um, Ashar. And thank you all for the invitation today uh, to speak to you. Uh, I'm going to look at um, a, a few points in connection with current trends, but I thought I would begin by identifying what I see as the three reasons why people use uh, dispute boards. Uh, the first one is dispute avoidance, and I think uh, Yasmin and Bashar have both uh, explained uh, how this is done, where both parties from the beginning of a contract want to avoid uh, formal disputes, and therefore they use the FIDIC contract form or some version of it uh, very often to uh, appoint a dispute board. And in those cases, as we know, dispute boards are appointed um, at the beginning and can work very well in avoiding disputes, uh, saving costs and probably more importantly, saving relationships and getting the project built uh, on time. And I think all of us on the panel have been involved uh, in these projects where we have examples of these working very well. So that is the primary and increasing focus and purpose for dispute boards. But we have to recognize, which I think has been touched on, that there are two other uh, routes for um, having dispute boards. One is where only one party wishes to take advantage of the dispute board mechanism in the contract, which is often the contractor. And that is with a view to resolving disputes quickly and often trying to resolve cash flow issues. In those situations, often the dispute board is not appointed until a dispute has arisen. And I, I still would say that I'm appointed more frequently in these types of dispute boards than I am in the dispute avoidance board. Uh, although, as I say, I, I hope it is changing. 
The challenge in these uh, dispute boards is to gain the confidence of the employer and engineer in the project that the dispute board is an adequate and, and appropriate mechanism uh, for um, trying to resolve disputes. The final one, uh, the third one, is where the dispute board and the dispute board decision is being used as a stepping stone to arbitration. And this will often be because the contract requires it, but where either one party or both do not really believe that the dispute board will ever resolve the issue. Uh, they believe that that will be arbitration, but they must go to a dispute board for a decision first of all. Sometimes this is, uh, arises in countries where there are problems with enforcement of dispute board decisions and there remain many issues with enforcement uh, in certain countries. So that is the background uh, to uh, my experience of why people um, have dispute boards. Turning now to um, what are the trends, uh, we've heard already that COVID has of course had a huge impact uh, on dispute boards, as it has on all of our lives, but certainly very much in dispute resolution. And uh, I think that one of the um, issues about um, COVID, of course, is that it has encouraged all of us to be innovative about how to keep moving with resolution of disputes uh, with construction as a whole. And that I, I have been amazed really at how everyone has adapted to being able to deal with these things remotely. Uh, as has been explained um, with uh, ISTAC, how quickly provisions were put into place to allow, for example, remote hearings. So that has definitely been um, a positive. The problem I think is about the dispute avoidance role of a dispute board and how that can be dealt with remotely. Uh, because for me, I think that is the biggest challenge. If the dispute board is already in place and the dispute board members know uh, the individuals because they have already met them, continuing remotely is less of an issue. And I certainly have um, one long running dispute board where We'd met on many occasions uh, for a couple of years face to face. We're now doing it remotely, but because we all know one another, this does assist. And in that respect, I've not really felt uh, any um, uh, disadvantage of moving uh, to the remote um, situation. But where a party or parties are starting out with a dispute board and starting only with a, a remote um, meeting, there are challenges. Uh, my view is it is definitely still worth doing, but I think everyone has to be aware that we do lose that individual uh, contact. What I found is that um, some of the dispute boards that perhaps might have been established um, for dispute avoidance um, purposes have not quite started. I've maybe gone a bit more slowly uh, at the moment because of that. Whereas referral of disputes and dispute boards has been very active, uh, which I think is, is very interesting. Um, I have, for example, two hearings coming up in the next fortnight on uh, dispute board referrals. Uh, these were dispute boards which uh, were only are only in place to deal with disputes, but dealing with them remotely has not been seen to be a challenge at all. We're all using the DRBF remote hearing protocol. Uh, we've discussed with parties how this is going to work. Uh, we've spoken about videos um, of certain issues on the site. Uh, like Yasmin, I also have experience of um, drone footage being used um, in these particular ones that I'm involved in. Uh, videos of the particular features that are an issue uh, are really all, all that is needed. So uh, there's no um, barrier to us doing it remotely, and I'm very keen that we continue to do it. But I think everyone who wants to develop the dispute avoidance rule in contracts that are just about to start with dispute at boards will probably welcome the time when we can uh, meet uh, in person. 
Uh, one other trend that I think is very interesting to note uh, over and above those that Yasmin has spoken about is that the ICC has established a task force on arbitration and ADR, which has really been put in place to try to develop some form of mixed forms of dispute resolution so that, for example, rather than once you've pressed the button on arbitration, that is it, there's no possibility of anything else, or once you've decided to go to mediation, that is it. Uh, I think there's a view that there could be what you might call a mix and match approach to issues so that parties may wish to continue with the dispute board to help in certain issues, but they may decide that they wish to mediate on something else, or they may wish to arbitrate on something else. So I'm involved in this task force in trying to look at different ways where we can give people what they want in effect, which is um, moving forward with the project and if disputes arise, uh, resolving them quickly. My final point that I will touch on is costs, because it is always the one that comes up. It's always the one that is cited to me. Um, well, why do we put one in place for dispute avoidance? It costs too much. Um, we're, we don't have any problems. Uh, is this just an additional uh, waste of time and a waste of cost? Um, now, I may be biased because I'm involved in dispute boards, but I have not been in any uh, dispute board situation where I do not believe that there has been a saving in cost and in parties' time in trying to resolve issues uh, through dispute boards. What I also think is interesting is have the number of referrals of disputes gone up since we've done it remotely because parties don't need to pay for dispute boards traveling costs uh, of going to uh, wherever it is they're going to have the hearing. And I think there is a cost issue here that we do need to explore more so that parties understand how much is it likely to cost? What might be the savings? And I know um, the DRBF have been collecting statistics for a number of years, but of course, because of confidentiality, it is very difficult to get too much apart from personal experience uh, about that. So I, I would like to end on a positive note. I think dispute boards and their use um, is definitely increasing. We have to recognize that without the personal contact, um, we are missing something at the moment, but I think that people have been extremely adaptable in doing what we can uh, with remote uh, hearings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindy. Uh, now, for then the last uh, speaker, uh, Sam Whitehouse, uh, he's going to talk about the application of this port in the UAE and the GCC region. Uh, Sam is a chartered quantity surveyor. He serves as contract claim consultant and has been actively involved on a number of dispute boards in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, he serves as country representative for United Arab Emirates for the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation. He's currently a director in FDI Consulting uh, based in Dubai. Uh, floor is yours, uh, Sam. Uh, I think uh, you haven't uh, unmuted. I beg your pardon. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'll just bring up uh, uh, the my presentation. Has it come up? No. Just bear with me. Can you see this, the screen? Is it come up on the screen? Yes, we can see. All oh, right, sorry. Yeah, great. Okay. Let me just uh, get rid of the document. All right, let me. Seems to be uh, a little technical problem. We said before we were all experts in. Uh, uh, in um, in Zoom, I'm obviously proving uh, that that's that's actually not the case. So uh, just just bear no with me. 
<laughs> Let me just bear it. There we go. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about today is to um, is to give you an oversight of DB's use in the UAE. Um, the main forms of contract on which, under which we operate, main methods of, of the dispute resolution here, how DBs fit in and how often they're used in the UAE. And then talk a little bit about the effect of COVID-19 on the DB process that we found out here and share some thoughts on whether the current method of working should be the new normal when we eventually uh, emerge from the pandemic, which, which really sort of echoes really what, what Lindy has, has just said there. Um, there are many sort of Turkish contractors working in, in the UAE, so uh, hopefully this will give you a, an insight uh, if you do work out here, if you're a contractor. The common forms of contract out here are um, mainly FIDIC or FIDIC based. Uh, usually the Red Book uh, is the most usual form. And my, most are now based on the 1999 first edition, but many are still based on the, the early 1987 editions. Um, I mean, it's only recently that the RTA, for instance, for instance has moved to a, to a 1999 version. So I don't expect to see the 2017 version for, for many years to come yet. But the continued use of the pre-99 versions, uh, which doesn't obviously include any provisions for the DBs, is one of the major obstacles to date in limiting uh, the use of DBs in the area. The most common forms of dispute uh, resolution in the, in the UAE is, is arbitration, and that's usually at the uh, Dubai International Arbitration Centre, or, or its equivalent in Abu Dhabi, which are well known and respected. The local courts where uh, the proceedings are co conducted in Arabic and under Sharia law, and the Dubai uh, International Finance Centre courts, uh, which is a free zone in Dubai, Dubai and has its own court system empowered under Dubai law to have jurisdiction to regulate the disputes within that free, free zone. Uh, this was subsequently expanded to cover disputes from parties outside of the free zone who wanted to opt into that court system. And that court system includes a technology and construction division, which is sort of based on the English court system. Uh, and the proceedings are conducted in English and based on, on a common, common law uh, system. And of course, we've got dispute boards. By far the most common method, and certainly on the major project, is arbitration, usually at, at DIAC. And the uptake in the local courts is limited as it's conducted in Arabic. And the DIFC courts are relatively new, with a limit inclusion in construction contracts or by parties opting in to use the courts. Uh, so the question is, where do dispute boards fit in uh, to that arena in the UAE? And They've been limited to date, really, for a number of factors. Um, continued use of the older forms of contracts, and that's restricted the, the new use. But that's gradually changing. FIDIC 99 versions are now probably the most common form of contract. And there's also, as, as the other panellists have, have, have talked about, the lack of knowledge on how boards operate, the lack of knowledge on the benefits they can bring to the party and, and the, the, the economic benefits they bring. Reluctant to take the first step, um, usually due to a lack of appreciation of the benefits that the, the DBs can bring to both parties. Uh, and arbitration is still considered the norm uh, and, and the view that the DBs can be just a, a step along the way through to arbitration. And it's difficult to break that down resistance. Uh, and as a result, uh, DBs were frequently struck out of, out of contracts. Uh, and that's meant that the uh, traditionally, the use of DBs in the country has been limited to date. And as, a, as the DRBF representative, I see my role really as, as mainly of one of education, promotion of the use of DBs within the region. But the positive news is that's beginning to change. And there's a real sort of visible change over the last couple of years. And the pace seems to be accelerating. Um, as I say, the pre-99 editions of FIDIC have largely been now replaced. And of course, that gives the, the employers the choice then of whether they include DBs in their contract or not. That coupled with uh, an increased awareness of DBs and the knowledge of, of the benefits has also played a part. Uh, and as a result, a number of the major developers are now beginning to include DBs in their standard form of contracts. When I came out here sort of five, six years ago, I rarely saw any DB provisions in any contract, but now it's, it's quite common to see it. In, in fact, I've got to say, far to say, it's probably more unusual on the newer contracts to, uh, to not see it. 
And another major development has been the, the inclusion of DB provisions in the Expo 2020 construction packages by the DB government. And that's been a, a really significant step forward. Uh, and, and it's hoped that that will encourage more people to use the DB process. And by the way, Mark, uh, 1st of October 2021 to 31st of March 2022 in your, in your diaries, Expo 2020 is, is, is really going to be a fantastic spectacle, but uh, at least they've, they've, they've moved forward on a, on a more, um, you know, sort of a better way forward, really. So the, the DB um, use in, 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 uh, in the UAE to date, um, the now, because they now begin to be, to be included in the, in the contract provisions, uh, they're now uh, being actively used, but it's still very early days. All of the DB provisions that I've seen to date provide for the ad hoc boards only. I'm not aware of any project in the UAE uh, to date that's had a standing board either uh, you know, uh, active or, or, or even in the contract. And that's pretty disappointing given that the majority of the contracts here are administered using the FIDIC Red Book. Uh, and it's also a missed opportunity, I've got to say, for a standing board to be in place on the Expo 2020 projects. You know, that's a, that would have been an ideal project long, uh, for, a, for a standing board, a large and very, very time critical. But I think at the moment it's, it's probably one step at a, at a, at a time. Uh, and the hearing uh, for at least one of those has, has taken place under the COVID restrictions using a web-based system. Uh, and I, I won't sort of dwell too much on, on the next slide. I mean, that's, that's been talked about by Lindy and, uh, and others beforehand. Um, it's worked very, very well, as, as, as I think it surprised most people. And I think, as, as discussed earlier, that's, that's really down to the parties being flexible uh, and willing to, to sort of push the, uh, the dispute resolution procedure along uh, and, and take it on board new technology uh, that, that, that really, I don't think any of us have thought about this time last year, really. The, the, the problem uh, that I've got is really uh, something that Lindy, Lind, Lindy touched on, which is which is really the site visits, uh, and that's really my main area of concern going forward. Uh, and I think if we if we look at the point of difference between a dispute board and any other form of dispute resolution, the, and, and the reason it's got uh, the procedure got its support is, is its unique ability, with, primarily with the use of standing boards, to actually avoid the problems during the construction process, rather than simply deciding on, on a dispute that's already occurred. Much better, as we found with COVID, to, to avoid rather than solve the problem later. Uh, and in my experience, which has mainly been cent centred in Africa uh, on, on standing boards, uh, that dispute avoidance has usually achieved a result, uh, is usually achieved as a result of the periodic site visits of the standing boards. As Lindy said, uh, that's all about getting the, um, the, 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 the the buy-in of, of really of the, of the parties taking part in those in those meetings, um, but uh, it's it, there's been some advantages with with the way that we've worked over the last twelve months. But we also see possible disadvantages on the process under the, the current restrictions. The advantages, as, as have already been talked about, is is the increased use of te technology. Drone footage uh, has increased record keeping greatly. Uh, ability to carry out meetings on projects that are not easily accessible or, or you know, the board members can't travel uh, uh, and has allowed the DBs to continue under, under the current restrictions and it's much better, as Lindy has said, to continue uh, with, with the process or, or start the process than have, to have no standing board in place at all. Uh, that just misses the point of, uh, of, of the DB process really. But I can see a possible uh, limitations on the current method, method of working and, and I say this as a perspective of, of somebody who spent much of his working life on, on construction sites. Uh, the possible issues are what, what are we, oops, sorry, um, what, what, what is the DB um, going to site for? It's not simply just to observe the progress achieved. Uh, the benefit of a site visit by a highly experienced board ranging from engineers to experienced construction lawyers, is as much as to look at what's gonna happen uh, as what's actually happened to date. Um, it's an opportunity for the board to, to raise issues of concern that parties are either not aware of or don't want to discuss, uh, but could become a problem in the future. Make assessments how the work's been carried out and the resources employed. 
look at the practical difficulties, employees, terrain, weather, the effects of those, and are the engineer and the contractor actually addressing the problems? And, 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 I, and I find Zoom very, very useful for a, um, a set agenda uh, that, that you can talk about and, and, and work through the agenda with the parties. It's probably not so good at assessing whether people are actually talking to each other and dealing with problems uh, away from, 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 from that format. And frequently, uh, that's not the case in the early parts of the project. And it's, it's very, very common that one or other parties either doesn't want, doesn't want to admit that they have a problem or fears embarrassing the other party. And it's part of the DB's role to identify those, identify those issues. And by getting such factors out on the table at an early stage, there's less chance of those issues becoming a problem in the future. And I'll share Lindy's view. I'm not sure that a remote view of events would allow a board to be as effective as it could or should be. Uh, and that, that will, again, remain to be seen as we get more data that comes through uh, over, the, over the next 12 months. The second issue, uh, and again, this was touched on by Bashar, is, is, the, is the use of the, the subclause 20.2 non-binding opinions. And certainly all of the projects I think that I've uh, been, been involved with this, on, where, where there's been standing DBs have used this pro process and the procedure has usually been agreed upon following discussions during the site visits. And quite often such opinions are based on questions of entitlement and provide a quick but considered uh, indication of what the DB think of a particular issue. And in my experience this has proved to be a really really powerful dispute avoidance tool with the majority of the opinions being accepted by the parties without escalation to a formal hearing. And again, I've got real concerns that the current conditions uh, prevent this being used as effective as it should be. Uh, but, but it's early days. I mean, I mean, COVID is not going to go away in the next couple of months. And uh, for both sets of concerns, it's early days. And, and we need, as, a, as an organisation, to get more feedback uh, and to speak to the people actively involved with the standing board on, on what their conclusions are. So if I can, I suppose, draw some conclusions from that. Um, my personal view, and I think shared by the other panellists, is how we can conduct a DB uh, in the future will change due to our experiences during the pandemic. Remote hearings and visits can be a great advantage in certain circumstances. For example, it allows a board to carry out its function in areas of restricted travel or very remote sites. Remote hearings and visits uh, can make the DB process more accessible for smaller value projects that perhaps uh, have been deemed to be sort of unviable in terms of, of cost. Uh, the inability of one or more DB members to travel to site or one of the parties is, is actually no longer a barrier to conducting hearings or site visits. And the technological advance, and advancements, such as drones, uh, are clearly allowing for better record keeping. And that's, that's, that's always got to be a bonus, whether, whether the problem is, is, is headed off before it becomes a real uh, dispute. And of course, the other thing that, that again, uh, I think Lindy mentioned is, is the Zoom uh, or Teams allows the parties to conduct a meeting at any time. And that's a real advantage if there's a material event in between side visits. Up to now, that's been sort of by letter, by phone call. Uh, uh, and and it, it's, it's really the problem has passed before, the, before the, the DB can really get involved and, 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 and have a detailed discussion with the parties as it's happening. So it all, it all points to me to a, a more flexible and accessible approach in the future. Um, but the question for me is, is, is the way of working the new normal? We, we hear lots of talk about the new normal. And I think not quite. I think I remain to be convinced that the current restrictions and the resultant methods that we've, we've used over the last two months, uh, 12 months, should be used as the new normal. But I think we kind of take advantage of what we've discovered and how we've worked over the last year to make a better normal in the future by supplementing what we had pre-COVID. And I see great advantages from that uh, uh, over the next sort of few years. Uh, but as I say, time will tell as we receive more, more feedback uh, from, from the DB members. Uh, so I think it, there's, a, there's a, lot to, um, a lot to sort of discover really over the next 12 months of, of how these jobs pan out. Uh, but uh, that remains to be seen. So uh, for me, that's thank you. And uh, I hope that's you know, giving you some insight into the DBs in the UAE uh, and certainly what we found under the, under the current restrictions. So I'll, I'll hand back to, uh, to, the, to the mediator. Thank you, Sam. Uh, that was a very good and detailed presentation. 
now uh, I see no questions. Uh, that means uh, we came to an end. Uh, and uh, we still have a few minutes to go. Uh, if uh, any of the speakers uh, uh, have a few words to uh, say something, you know, as uh, closing remarks, uh, if they uh, want to do so, they may do. Uh, does anyone want to say a few things? I think we have a couple of questions. Bashar Bey, uh, do you want to say? Uh, I think that was internal communication, not meant to be a question, so we can skip it. So it was in Turkish, so sorry about this. Oh, okay. oh no, there, there were English we, questions. Yeah, we will disregard that, uh, Lindy. Okay. So th that means... Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, the highlights uh, of uh, uh, today's webinar uh, on my side are uh, the great news uh, from Yasemin. And uh, uh, we, we are looking forward, I think, uh, especially the communication between FIDIC and World Bank. And uh, this will put a lot of load uh, to us, uh, Zia Ocam, uh, I think, uh, to uh, introduce these uh, changes uh, to the Turkish uh, construction community. And uh, this will absolutely increase the use of these pit ports. And uh, noting that World Bank will require uh, these pit ports uh, to make a, a contribution uh, to its projects. Uh, that means uh, tens of uh, uh, projects uh, in Turkey, because World Bank is uh, uh, one of the main uh, funders of uh, Turkish infrastructure investments, uh, hospitals, uh, bridges, uh, water treatment plants, a lot of transportation uh, facilities. Absolutely. As this like we very welcome these developments and we are very open to cooperate to promote and introduce the concept of the AB to the construction industry in Turkey. Thank you. Uh, one question came. Uh, if it is okay, I will read to the floor. Uh, hello, thank you everyone for this very informing webinar. I'm not sure if my question falls in line with the subject of this webinar. Uh, FIDIC contracts is quite a new concept for me. I have been reviving many contracts that uh, my organization signing abroad, mostly bidding contracts for construction works. And none of them included any clause regarding to FIDIC and arbitration. They also certainly were not similar to FIDIC contracts. Could you give me some tips about positive parts of having FIDIC referred in our contracts for convincing my superiors and other party who are not familiar with FIDIC? Also for construction contracts, if we are talking about cheaper countries, is it always cost effective to opt out domestic jurisdiction? Thank you. Uh, Hojam, do you want to say something or? Um, well, I can start and I'm sure uh, our colleagues will uh, uh, contribute very, uh, very nicely and fruitfully. Uh, well, um, FIDIC is a standard contract and the, the beauty of this, uh, many people are familiar with FIDIC. It is like speaking English, you know, if you have a a common point to communicate, it is always much better. And also uh, it has some advantages. For example, if you would like to finance your project, most probably the international finance institutes such as banks may require standard contract like FIDIC. And FIDIC has a very strong tradition. So that means the requirement, the need of the industry is being discussed every year you see so many different kinds of version of FIDIC, that means a development. What is the need of the industry is being discussed by the experts from each perspective, employer, contractor, engineers, arbitrators, engineers, etc. So then um, the industry try to find the best practice um, uh, to contract. So therefore FIDIC is a benefit of everybody. And you can easily change the FIDIC contract FIDIC contracts are not like mandatory rules. If you want to amend any provision of the FIDIC contract, 
you can do so. Therefore, we have general conditions and special conditions. So I think that is the way you should explain to uh, your colleagues, your people in your company, and they should see the benefit of uh, FIDIC instead of drafting the contract from the scratch and try to convince the other party that this is a reasonable contract. At the end of the day, there is one language that the construction industry speak, and it is this kind of standard contracts and FIDIC is one of them and very famous one. So therefore it is for the sake of the industry to utilize such uh, FIDIC contracts. It is true that for the big contracts, big projects, FIDIC is used very commonly because of the international financing, but we also have green FIDIC that is designed for the small project and non-complex project. At least for uh, starting, you can try to use or your uh, superior can uh, review the green FIDIC that is specifically designed for the beginners or for small and non-complex project. So you see all these uh, different uh, colors of the books. Uh, it uh, answer to the different needs of the industry, red FIDIC, yellow FIDIC, uh, silver FIDIC, etc. You can easily find which is the proper FIDIC book for your project. And then it is a, a standard contract that you can use. But at the end of the day, it is a soft law. It is only uh, applicable when the party agrees. Even if you don't use FIDIC contract, at least as a beginning, you can review the FIDIC contract and import some of the provisions that may also make you familiar with the FIDIC contract. And when you feel comfortable, then you can start uh, using FIDIC contract. That is my humble uh, opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Ajem. Uh, Lindy, do you want to say a few words as well? Uh, I, I agree entirely with, with what has been said. Um, I will perhaps pick up on the second part of the question, which was, is it cost effective to opt out of domestic jurisdiction? And I, I'm really uh, saying with the FIDIC contract, you need not opt out of anything because the dispute board procedure is uh, an additional procedure before you might finally go to wherever you're going, whether it's arbitration or litigation. And the whole purpose of it is that uh, if disputes are referred, you uh, get a decision within 84 days. So um, I think that is why um, I, I don't see it as opting out of anything. It's giving you um, alternative and additional procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. Uh, well, uh, that's it. Uh, no more questions. Uh, this is, uh, well, we came to the end of the program. Uh, it was certainly beneficial to me. And I'm sure it was the same for the many participants. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all, Professor Akinji, Lindy, Yasemin, Sam, and Bashar for your very valuable presentations. Uh, and also, of course, my thanks um, uh, uh, go to the uh, patient uh, attendees. Uh, hope to see you all in another event and uh, take care for now. Thank you. Goodbye.